morning we're just going to talk about my, one of my favorite topics to talk about. It, uh, something that I've been dealing with now for 28 years. And um, um, when I think back at how we did some of, or how we treated some of these conditions when I was trained as a resident to the way we, we do them now, it's, it's literally light, light years ahead. And um, um, I, th I think we'll have some fun with this this morning. We have a nice small group, which is great. So this can be very casual. So if you have any questions at any point, please just ask me. This is nothing formal about this this morning. Um, we're going to go over some, some slides here and uh, we'll look at a couple of pictures and if you guys have any questions about anything, we'll, we'll be glad to, to sit and talk about them. Okay. We're going to talk about what actually a bunion is today uh, and a hammer toe and, and what is arthritis of the great toe joint, uh, what are the causes of each of these problems and how each, each problem is treated. Okay, bunions. A bunion is, is one of the most common foot conditions that foot and ankle specialists treat. It's characterized by a lump or a bump on the side of the toe. Uh, and we're going to differentiate that later from people who get a bump on the top of their foot, on the, on the same joint. Um, the big toe can then shift or deviate toward the second toe. In some cases, the second toe can even overlap. And that's a typical bunion problem. Okay. Uh, the size of the bunion, the bump, varies from person to person. Um, the size of the bump does not equate with symptoms. There are some people who have huge bumps, have very little pain. Other people who have small bumps and have a lot of pain. So it really depends on the person's foot structure and, and, and the individual. Um, you can get a bunion on the big toe side of the foot, but you can also get a bunion on the little toe side of the foot. When you get it on the little toe side, it's called a bunionette or a tailor's bunion. It's a structural shift of several bones. It's not just a bump that develops. These long bones on our foot are called our metatarsals. There's five of them. The first metatarsal is the one that's involved with, with a bunion. There are two little bones called sesamoids underneath the metatarsal. They should be centered under the metatarsal. So if you notice, the second and third and fourth metatarsals are relatively straight and parallel with each other. But the first metatarsal is starting to shift out this way. And that's basically what a bunion is. It's a shift or a movement of the metatarsal bone in that direction. And then what will happen is the ligaments on this side of the joint will tighten and then the big toe starts to shift over toward the second toe. This is a hereditary condition. Shoes don't cause bunions. You know, I have women that come in all the time and say, oh, I have a bunion because I wore high heel shoes. Well, then why do men get them? Um, they can aggravate the problem once you have it, but it doesn't cause it. They can occur as early as the teenage years. You'd be surprised how many people we have come in the office in their you know, 14, 15, 16 year age category that have bunions already. Um, but most patients that we see usually are, are in middle age. Uh, it can develop in people with a low arch, it can develop in people with a high arch. And the discomfort is usually localized right around that bump area. As we said, showed you on the x-ray, the first metatarsal bone shifts towards the midline of the body. Ligaments and tendons on the side of the joint tighten and that's what pulls the, sec the uh, big toe over toward the second toe. And there is some extra bone that forms on the side of the metatarsal. This is an important point. Not all bunions have arthritis. Some people equate arthritis of the joint with bunions. They're two separate problems. Not all bunion deformities have arthritis associated with it. A person could have a bunion and not have arthritis. And then there are people who have arthritis of the joint but don't have a bunion. And then you have some people who actually have both. Again, here's a, it's a shift of this bone out this way. The sesamoid bones are here. There's ligaments that are attached to them. They tighten, and then the big toe starts to come over. Now you can see there's some early arthritic changes in this joint because the joint space isn't as nice as it should be. What are your treatment options when you have the problem? They include both conservative and surgical approaches. Conservatively, you can use a splint on the toe. Uh, we can inject some cortisone in the joint. Um, you can use ice when it gets sore. The use of arch supports or orthotics in the shoe, shoes take pressure off of the, um, 
uh, bunionaria. Anti-inflammatories can help. But they all, all of these things just provide temporary relief. They put a Band-Aid on the problem. You're not addressing the actual root or cause of the problem. Long-term relief or resolution usually requires a surgical procedure. There's been a big change in the way we do bunion procedures <coughs> to what we did them 10 and 15 and 20 years ago. Um, when I was in my residency in the mid-80s, people were still in the hospital for a couple of days when they had a bunion operation. Uh, today, you know, they're all done as an outpatient. Um, but one of the big things that uh, has helped is pain relief afterwards. Today, most of our bunion patients receive what are called a popliteal block. They, re they get a nerve block behind their knee, which then numbs their leg and their foot. And that gives them relief for the first, usually about the first 12 to 15 hours. Um, so then when that wears off, they'll have some discomfort, but it's usually not as bad as it used to be years ago. So uh, you hear people say, oh, bunion surgery is very painful. Nowhere near as, as it was before. A surgical bunionectomy procedure is typically performed under local anesthetic and IV sedation. So you're, you know, given IV sedation, a little bit heavier than you would receive like for a colonoscopy, uh, usually to the point that you're kind of taking a nap. Uh, it's an outpatient setting. Um, the type of procedure we do varies, and we'll talk about that. But usually the first metatarsal bone is cut and repositioned. So here you have somebody, that bone was out here. There was a cut made in this bone and a portion of the bone was brought back in and we have three little screws in there to hold that in position. Now you can see the alignment has been restored. Post-op recovery varies. It uh, depends on the type of procedure that we do. Uh, it can be as simple as walking in a surgical shoe until the swelling resolves or it can be as involved as being non-weight bearing you know, for six weeks. The average person who, have a, who has a bunion, the average procedure that we do, you're looking at a situation where you're usually using a walker or crutches for about two and a half weeks. That's, that's a typical, typical situation. Um, you're in a surgical shoe or a surgical boot for about a month. What are the results that we expect? Well, first of all, we expect relief of the problem. When the appropriate procedure is performed, the reoccurrence rate is very low less than 10% typically. So you have about a 90% chance of it not coming back. Um, they sh patients should be able to return to their activity without the pain of the bunion. We're gonna talk specifically now about a certain type of bunionectomy procedure, the one that I just showed you on that x-ray. It's called the Austin bunionectomy, and this is the most common type of bunionectomy done in this country today. Um, usually indicated for mild to moderate deformities. A V cut is made in the bone. The bone is then, a portion of the bone is then repositioned and we put usually two or three little screws in there to hold that in position. Uh, Post-op, usually partial weight bearing for about two to three weeks uh, in a surgical shoe or boot. Looking at the foot from the side, a cut is made like a V in the metatarsal bone. And then that is repositioned and we put, put the two or three screws in there to hold that in until it heals. It takes about six weeks for that bone to, to heal. Just like a fracture takes about six weeks, takes about six weeks for the bone to heal. This is what it looks like looking at it from the top. It's cut and repositioned. The other type of procedure that we do quite often is something called a lapidus bunionectomy, and this is a more aggressive procedure. These are for people who have a very severe deformity where the bone has really shifted over far. Or if I have a 15 or 16 year old or 17, 20 year old comes in with a real flexible, what we call a hypermobile foot, and they already have a pretty significant bunion, bunionectomy, or bunion problem, we're gonna probably do a lapidus on them because it's the most aggressive procedure, but it also gives you the lowest chance of reoccurrence. So you have a young person, you know, we wanna do the best situation, or make it the best possible situation so 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, it doesn't come back for them. Uh, a portion of the bone and cartilage is removed from the metatarsal, and then the bone behind it is called the cuneiform. So bone is removed from both of those areas the entire metatarsal bone is repositioned 
And we actually screw the two bones together. We actually fuse the metatarsal and the cuneiform bone together. This involves non-weight bearing for six weeks. So it's a longer recuperation, but again, uh, a much more predictable result. So here, we brought the entire bone over, and we basically fuse this bone to this bone. Okay. Foot surgery is an inconvenience. Why did I put that up there? Am I trying to talk you out of it? No. But I, I tell people, you have to realize what you're going to go through. If you hear of somebody with a gimmick or a quick fix, oh, you can have your bunion procedure and be walking out of the office, uh, take that for what it's worth. You know, if you're going to have something done, give it the time it takes to heal. Um, it's going to throw a monkey wrench into your life for a couple weeks. There's no question about it. This is a part of your body you're going to be walking on the rest of your life. So you want to give it the time it takes to heal. Any questions about the bunion before we... Go ahead. You don't use pins at all? Uh, not so much anymore. It's kind of an older technique. Um, that Austin bunionectomy that we showed. When I was trained as a resident, back then we used pins. We'd actually put a pin through that cut and part of the pin actually stuck out of the, out of the foot. And we would keep that pin in there for anywhere from three to six weeks and then pull that pin out. Um, it was a good technique, but over the years that's evolved. We don't like to have something sticking out of the foot if we don't have to, because if you have something sticking out of the foot, that means something can get into the foot. Bacteria can get in. Uh, you have the chance of getting what's called a pin track infection. Plus, the pins only hold bones in certain positions. When we put a screw across a cut, not only does the screw hold it in position, but the screw actually gives us compression. It pushes the two cuts together, which actually increases the chance of healing and also reduces the time it takes to heal. So using screws today is a much more evolved or advanced way than using pins. Now sometimes we'll use a combination. I'll put uh, one or two screws in and a pin, depending on what I find when I get in there. But the vast majority of time today is, is, is we use screws. Hammer toes. Um, now we're talking about the lesser toes, or the second, the third, or the fourth, or the fifth toes. And there's, ba there's three basic classifications of hammer toes. Hammer toe is a, is a generalized term. There's a hammer toe problem, and underneath that, what's called the overlapping toe. There's something called a claw toe and a mallet toe. Um, and we'll talk about that. This is your typical hammer toe type of problem. The toe is raised. Um, sometimes a person will develop a corn on the top of the toe because the shoe rubs on that bump. Um, sometimes the pain will be back here though at the joint. And it can affect any of the four lesser toes. Most commonly it's the second toe, but it's not unusual to see people come in with hammer toes on all, all four of their lesser toes. Discomfort can occur on the top of the toe because of the shoe rubbing, uh, or it can occur on the bottom, on the ball of the foot, because now the toe has come up and the ball of the foot has more pressure on it now because the toe is not bearing the weight that it should. Corns or calluses can develop because of this problem. So you'll see people come in with these specific calluses on the bottom of their foot. And most of the time, that's because the toe is up so much that now that metatarsal bone underneath the toe is getting too much pressure. And that's why they'll develop a callus there. Bunion and hammer toes often occur together. The same hereditary factors that cause one condition causes the other. As the gray toe shifts towards the second toe, it could have a deforming force against the lesser toe. Sometimes as that big toe comes over, it'll push the second toe up. In the early stages, pain and swelling can develop at the base of the toe. So we're talking about a situation now where not necessarily in the toe itself, but back at this joint, they start to have pain. 
This is caused by an overstretching and irritation of the joint capsule. As the deformity progresses, the plantar plate, which is a structure on the bottom of the foot, can become tethered or ruptured. Once that plantar plate is torn, the toe loses stability and it will lift or shift up. So that plantar plate is such an important structure. And when it gets overstretched or tore, that's when the toe really pops up to the point where sometimes the toe can actually dislocate at the, at the joint. So you see this toe raise up. It's common for people to come in and when they stand, that second toe doesn't even touch the ground anymore. That's not unusual. Um, but that toe will lift up and then sometimes it'll cross over the great toe. Treatment, conservative treatment typically consists of something that's called a Budin splint. The Budin splint um, has been real helpful. It's been around for a long time. It's simply a, 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 a device that has a, a, a elastic band on the top and you put it on before you put your socks on and what that will do is it'll keep your toe down while you have your shoes and socks on. The minute you take it off, this toe's gonna pop back up. It doesn't correct anything, it controls it. But while you have that on, during the course of the day, it'll keep that toe down and it takes a lot of pressure off the joint. And um, that in itself can make, a, can make a big difference for some people. <clears throat> Surgical interventions required when the use of a splint uh, no longer is helpful or if a person just doesn't want to continue to use a splint the rest of their life. There's been some significant surgical technique advances in the, in the last couple of years. Just in the last two years, there's been some big advances in how we, changes how, how we, we do a hammer toe repair. And as a result, the, the uh, predictability of the hammer toe repair is so much better. Uh, in the past, surgical procedures involved removing a portion of bone uh, from the bump area on the toe, the proximal phalange, and we would put a pin in. Again, this is where a pin would stick out of the tip of the toe. We did that for years. Um, the pin extruded from the tip of the toe and was left in place for about three to six weeks, and then we pulled that pin out. Today, we now use internal pins, so we don't have anything sticking out of the toe anymore. And these internal pins can stay in there the rest of your life. Um, the nice thing about these internal pins is they maintain a much better position of the toe long term. Years ago, when we used the pins and we would take the pin out, even if we kept the pin in for six weeks, three, four, five months afterwards, we still would sometimes see a shift in the bones. We'd see a, a loss of correction. But now with these internal pins, we don't see that anymore. Um, in some cases, especially the more significant hammer toe problems, we also have to shorten the metatarsal bone behind it. Post-op recovery usually involves use of a surgical shoe and partial weight bearing. So people can walk on their heel, we just have them keep weight off the ball of their foot for a couple weeks. So here's one of those internal pins that we now use. They're made of surgical stainless steel. Um, there's also some devices that are made of titanium. So here's an individual who had the bunion and the hammer toe problem, you know, corrected at the same time. And that's a common situation. In the, plate, in the case of plantar plate insufficiency or those, the plantar plate uh, tear, um, there's been some real uh, advances just in the last year or so. Um, a plantar plate repair involves suturing the torn or ruptured structure and attaching it to the base of the toe. Uh, through two small drill holes. The sutures are then attached on the top of the bone and this brings that second toe or third toe down and maintains a predicted uh, result. Here's one of those internal pins from the side. Okay. So now we're looking from the top, we're looking down into the joint. Here's your toe. Here's that plantar plate structure, and it tore from the toe. So what we do is we put two sutures in through here, and then we drill a hole, two holes up in the toe. Next slide. We drill two holes in the base of the toe, and those suture, that suture material is brought up through those two holes, and it's tied on the top. 
So we go from a situation where the toe is like this, and we then bring it down, we tie the suture up on top, and that maintains that corrected position. This has been a huge advance in the way we do hammer toes. And this has just been, we've just been doing this now for about a year and a half. Here I had to cut the metatarsal and shorten it a little bit, and you have two little screws that are holding that in position. But this is that planter plate repair. I want to show you a situation too. Now this is not an unusual, can everybody see this? This is not an unusual situation where you have the second toe really come over and overlap that gray toe. Not an, not an unusual situation. And this was always a challenge for us, you know, to repair something like that and keep it down. Keeping it down is one thing, but moving it over and, and keeping it more parallel with the third toe was a bigger challenge. Now that we were able to use this planter plate repair, that's been a big, a big help in, in correcting that. So we go from a situation like this, to this. Okay. Any questions about the hammer toes? The last thing we're going to talk about is arthritis of the great toe joint. It's called hallux rigidus. Hallux is another term for big toe, rigidus, rigid. Hallux rigidus, it's a common condition that typically presents as stiffness or soreness in the joint. Um, it's commonly mistaken for a bunion. We talked about with a bunion, you have a bump on the side of your big toe joint. This is where you have a bump more on the top of the joint. It's a degenerative arthritis of the great toe joint that is not age-related. Most of us are going to develop arthritis in our knees and our hips as we get older. That's just part of life. This is a condition that's more hereditary or more genetically derived. So I have people that are already in their 20s and 30s that come in that have a completely blown out great toe joint. Yet there's no arthritis anywhere else in their body. A similar condition occurs in the hand. People will get something called basal arthritis. It's arthritis of the thumb joint, but yet the rest of their hand doesn't have any arthritis in it. So this is more of a genetic predisposition. Sometimes it can occur as a result of, of an injury or an infection, but more often than not, this is all genetics. They develop a bump on the top of the gray toe joint, which is in contrast to the bunion, which is where the bump's on the side. Um, what actually is the bump? It's actually bone spurs that form as a result of the arthritis. Um, that causes internal friction in the joint and inflammation. As you get more inflammation and more friction, you start to see the cartilage erode inside the joint. And um, typically there's no arthritis anywhere else in the foot. As the joint deteriorates and stiffens, patients no longer want to push off that gray toe joint. So when we're walking, we use that gray toe joint to push off, to take our next step. Well, when people start to develop this problem, they avoid pushing off. And because it occurs over such a slow, a long period, they don't actually realize they're doing it. They start compensating and start shifting, and they can start putting weight more on the little toe side of their foot and start having other problems that develop then because of it. So they... You know, this is the, we need that kind of motion when we're walking. Well, in this particular condition, the joint doesn't work like this anymore. It stiffens up. This is what it looks like on x-ray. You can see a nice joint space here between the second metatarsal and the toe, the third, the fourth, the fifth. There's no longer a joint space here. We now have bone rubbing on bone. You can see the big bone spurs that are formed around the joint. Here's that bump on the top. It's 
all big bone spurs that are formed on the joint. And we'll see people, like I said, in their 20s and 30s that have this. So it's not an unusual thing to see in a younger person. What are, what are our options in terms of treatment? Initially, we usually use oral or injected anti-inflammatory medications, a cortisone injection or an oral anti-inflammatory, physical therapy, um, stiff sole shoes, or, or, and orthotics. The type of shoe you wear when you have this particular problem is extremely important. The stiffer the shoe, the better. If the shoe is too flexible or too flimsy, you're going to have a lot of stress put right on that joint. If symptoms persist despite the conservative treatment, we then go into a surgical uh, intervention. And we do a procedure that's called a chylectomy. Chylectomy is basically a removal of the bone spurs. Uh, the purpose is to remove the bone spurs and restore motion to the joint. Um, during the procedure, any damaged area of, of cartilage are drilled. It's a process that's called microfracturing. And this is an attempt to promote fibrocartilage or a scar tissue version of cartilage on the joint so that the joint has a better surface. We usually get these people into physical therapy then and have them get some motion back in that joint. So here we have a situation where we go in, clean up all of these bone spurs, and then get that joint to move again. In the more advanced stages of the condition, a joint fusion or a joint replacement is done. We actually do put artificial joints in, in the gray toe joint. Um, certain factors such as the patient's age, their activity level, their foot structure determines which of these two procedures we do. More often, we do the fusion versus the replacement. Fusion or arthrodesis of the joint, it eliminates the painful restricted motion of the damaged joint. Recovery is about six weeks non-weight bearing to that ball of the foot area. Replacement of the joint is a viable option in older, less active individuals. Um, the reason being is that the life expectancy of those artificial joints is usually about 10 to 15 years. Um, so we don't like to uh, get into a situation where we put an artificial joint in a young person because we know that they're going to have to have that joint replaced again once or twice in their life if they're too young. That's good. So again, you know, complete arthritis of the joint, no, joints, no joint space left when you compare it to the other joints. Now, a person could have a bunion as well with the arthritis. That would be where the metatarsal would then start to shift out this way. So we do see some individuals who have both the arthritis and a bunion together. That's it.